Hey everybody, I am super excited to be here. Uh, awesome to talk about Angular 2. Angular is one of my favorite technologies, of course. I've been doing a lot of Angular. So with that, let's get started. We're going to be talking about Angular 2, and the topic here is what you need to know. So my focus is not going to be on any particular details about Angular, but <clears throat> instead things that are going to be useful to you right now uh, as Angular is in sort of its preview mode. But of course we need to have the obligatory slide about me. So here's a slide about me. I'm there on the right, and we've got Jim Cooper on the left. Jim Cooper is a friend of mine and another Pluralsight author. Um, of course, I threw up my Twitter account so that you can all uh, hear my ramblings. A little personal website where I very frequently blog. Of course, I'm a Pluralsight author. That's my primary job right now. But I also organize some conferences, NGConf, NGVegas, and I'm on a couple of podcasts, JavaScript Jabber and Adventures in Angular. So if you are looking for um, an interesting podcast to watch then, or to listen to, go ahead and uh, check those out. So let's move on into what our agenda will be for this, pod, for this uh, webinar today. <clears throat> we are going to start by talking, off, by talking about the current state of Angular 2, where it's at, where it's headed. After that, we'll talk about the benefits, um, of Angular 2 versus Angular 1. We're going to be looking at transpilers because they play an important piece in Angular 2. And so we'll talk about those specifically. Then we'll talk about directives and components, both from Angular 1 and Angular 2 and how they interrelate. And the last thing we'll do is we will talk about migrating from Angular 1 to Angular 2. So let's talk first about the current state of Angular. I am going to share out my screen because I want to use a slightly different slide deck that actually has the bullet points changed. There's a little bit of a in the moment change here. All right, so the current state of Angular 2. Right now we're in developer preview. Now I'm used to other products that developer preview is a lot more stable. What developer preview means for Angular 2 is that it is changing. And by changing, I mean constantly. You can go a week and have significant syntax changes from, Angular, from versions of Angular, right, Angular 2 right now. It's crazy, constantly changing. That also means it's extremely unstable. What that means is that it's really hard right now to find combinations of tools that work together in order to play around with Angular and be working with it. But it is possible to do so. And so we are going to see that um, a demo project with Angular 2 running, but we will get to that a little bit later. Finally, when is Angular 2 going to release? Of course, the question on everybody's mind. And the answer to that is anybody's guess. Personally, I don't think it's going to release for quite a few months. Um, I don't think it will be over a year, but please don't quote me on that. So let's talk a bit about the benefits of Angular 2. To start off with, it pretty much has all the benefits that Angular 1 had. Um, that means it's a whole solution like Angular 1 is. Everything that you liked about Angular 1, so pretty much like about Angular 2, it is a lot different. And if you watched NG Europe last year or have been watching information about Angular 2, you'll know that there's a lot of people saying that it's very different, and it is very different. And we'll see that today. We'll see examples of the code and how different it is. But for the most part, everything that you liked about Angular 1 are, is still there in Angular 2, maybe in a slightly different form. There might be a few little things that, were, that you really liked about Angular 1 that have been changed. But for the most part, all the benefits of Angular 1 are still in Angular 2. <clears throat> 
One of the major changes between Angular 2 and Angular 1 is speed. Angular 2 is significantly faster. For an awesome example of this, uh, at ng-conf 2015 this year, uh, David Smith gave a talk uh, called React plus Angular equals speed. And at the end of that, he showcases the speed of Angular 2 in preview mode. And it's amazing. So Angular 2 is significantly faster than Angular 1. So that's one of our one going to be one of the key benefits that we're going to see. Another benefit is that it's got a simpler mental model. So there's fewer pieces that exist, fewer moving parts overall. And hopefully what that will mean is that in the long term, it will be easier to build bigger projects in Angular 2 than it is in Angular 1. Of course, I think it's pretty easy to build big projects in Angular 1 as it is right now, but this should just benefit us even more and make it simpler to learn and simpler to write big applications. Finally, Angular 2 is kind of introducing what I like to call DOM goodness, uh, DOM being the document object model. Uh, this is sort of a phrase I just made up myself, meaning that in Angular 2, um, we're actually going to get exposed to certain pieces of the DOM. And this is a good thing. Normally, we're used to being protected from the DOM because the API generally was pretty poor. But there are parts of the API for the DOM that are actually really good. And we're going to see some examples of that as we look at sample code today. So I think this is a big benefit that it's actually going to help us learn DOM a little bit more than we did before. And that's going to be good because we're not just going to be learning a framework when we're doing Angular 2. We're actually going to be learning more about JavaScript. And we'll see that uh, throughout this uh, presentation today. So when you're building with Angular 2, you basically have two options for your development process. One is to develop with the transpiler. The other is to develop without. Now, you might wonder why this is such a big deal. I'm going to show you um, in this presentation a little bit later on why that matters. But first, we need to talk about transpilers. Just very basic, what is a transpiler? Well, it basically converts any language, or a specific language into another language. And some great examples of that are the TypeScript transpiler, which converts TypeScript into JavaScript, or CoffeeScript. You might be familiar with that one. There's also plenty of transpilers out there that transpile from ECMAScript 6 to ECMAScript 5. Uh, ECMAScript 5 is the current version of JavaScript. ECMAScript 6 is the up-and-coming version of JavaScript. So let's talk about the development process. Our typical development process when we build a web app, when it comes to specifically just the JavaScript, is that we write our code in ECMAScript 5 or ES5. This is the JavaScript that the browser is currently run today. Then we take that code and we deploy it to the server. And once it's on the server, at some point, it's, a browser comes along and makes a request. And browsers, again, today, they run ES5 with uh, a few exceptions that current modern day browsers are starting to support some ES6 features. But for the most part, they just run ES5. And certainly, we can only count on them running ES5 at this time. So our browser is going to grab our ES5 code and run it. So that's our typical development process. But there's a new process that's becoming more and more popular today, and that's development with some kind of a build time transpiler which means that in our dev process, we do a little bit more. Instead of authoring our code in what is the current version of JavaScript, ECMAScript 5, we can author in ES6 or ES6+, plus, maybe ES, ES7, or TypeScript, or CoffeeScript, something like that. We run our code through a transpiler on our dev box, and then out pops ES5 code, what can be run on the server. At that point, we go back into your basic deployment model where we send that code up to the server, and then a browser comes along and requests that code, and then we're able to view it, or the browser is able to run it. Again, browsers only run ES5, so this is, a, uh, this is pretty, pretty similar to what we saw before, just with some more changes on the dev side. The good part about being able to do this is we can use new features in the latest versions of JavaScript, or features from languages like CoffeeScript and TypeScript, should they be languages that we like. There's another option for that, for doing this, um, that uses a runtime transpiler. So in this case, we start off the same way. We write our code in ECMAScript 6, or even ECMAScript 7, or another language like TypeScript or CoffeeScript. And then we deploy that to the server. Um, once it's on the server, 
it has to begin just ECMAScript 6 or 7. If we're doing TypeScript or CoffeeScript, we will have definitely wanted to transpile out those things. So on the server, we've got either ECMAScript 6 or I'm just going to call this ES6 Plus to make it easy. Some newer features of JavaScript that we can't count on them being able to be run in current browsers. Then the browser requests those files, but it doesn't do so in a normal GET request using a script tag. Instead, we use an XHR request. If you don't understand what that is, that's okay. Don't worry about that. Once it's on the browser, it's then run through a runtime transpiler down there on the browser. That spits out ES5, which is then loaded and ran by the browser because it can only run ES5. So this process is really only good for building toy projects or uh, in sort of preview and test mode because it puts extra load on the browser, not something you would want to do it in production. It's important to understand these different models of using a transpiler or not using a transpiler because that's going to affect Angular 2 a lot. And we will see that. With Angular 2, you have two options. You can use a transpiler or not use a transpiler. If you do use a transpiler, you have a few options. Tracer is a transpiler built by Google, and it's the most popular transpiler out there. And you can use Tracer both in build time mode or in runtime mode. In our demo today, we're going to use runtime mode because it's a, a bit simpler. There's another transpiler out there called Babel. Babel used to be called 6 to 5. They renamed it to Babel for a couple of reasons, one of which was uh, it doesn't just transpile ES6 to ES5 anymore. It also works with ES7 features. And the other transpiler out there that's becoming more and more popular is TypeScript. Recently, the Angular team has kind of teamed up with the TypeScript team, and they've been working together. And so as you look at Angular 2 over the coming months, you'll see a lot of information and usage of Angular 2 with TypeScript. Again, we're going to see later on in this, why, in this uh, webinar today why this is going to matter, why, it's, why transpilers play a role in Angular 2. So now that we've got our background information in, we're going to move on to our demo. So the demo code is available here. It's on my GitHub repo. It's the most recent uh, repository I've been working with, the ng 2 ps for Pluralsight webinar. Uh, very easy to find if you don't happen to copy down this URL right now. Uh, just get onto my GitHub repo and look through it. It's pretty obvious which one this is. So let's move into our code. Here we have a working Angular 2 demo. So <clears throat> what you'll see here is not going to right at the first jump out at you is looking like Angular 2. You're going to see that we've loaded up two script files, this system.js and this config.js. We've got a bootstrap style sheet just to make it look a little prettier. Um, we've got a body tag and then this custom to-do app tag. Now if this were Angular 1, we'd see some other things in here, but, we, but when we saw this tag, we'd know this is a directive. So this is not Angular 1, of course. We don't have all that extra ng app, that ng controller, or ng view. In fact, on this page right here, we have nothing that is Angular 2 specific. Right here, we've got our system.js. Let me just talk really briefly about that. This is a shim for the ES6 module system. This is a, a little library of code that will load code from the server. And this allows us to, this kind of helps out with doing our runtime transpiler. Then we've got this config.js. Uh, config.js is some code that we actually wrote. And it's some pretty interesting um, code that just basically set, sets options for us to use in our um, running of code. So I'm not going to go into it too much other than to look at, one, look at it and look at one line of code. So there's some configuration options up here. We're going to ignore those for the most part because they're not very interesting and not germane to what we're talking about today. This is the line of code right here on line 17 that I really want to talk about, which is import component slash app. And what this is saying is telling the module loader, go ahead and go and grab this components slash app file and run it. So if we look, I've got the code organized in a few different subfolders. This components folder right here, and I'm going to 
going to zoom this in just a little bit so that the code is easier to see. I can't zoom in the left-hand side, so if you're having a trouble seeing uh, the, this bar over here on the left, I apologize for that. So I'm going to go and open up this app file. Now this is going to be the JS file, so it's this app.js file right here. Now all of a sudden we're seeing something that's probably for a lot of people going to make our eyes boggle. This is not going to look at all like what we're used to with uh, JavaScript if you haven't been doing ECMAScript 6. And if you have been doing ECMAScript 6, you're going to see plenty of other stuff that, again, is going to be very different and not at all like what you're used to seeing, which is okay. I want you to take a minute and just um, go with me on this. We're going to um, ignore some things, talk about other things, and then come back and look at things. So just relax, sit back, and um, let's go through this piece by piece. The first thing I want to do is I want to talk about the fact um, that this is a component in Angular 2. All right? And the core of that is this class file right here. This is an ECMAScript 6 uh, construct, and it just comes out as a constructor function. So if you've done any reasonable amount of JavaScript, you'll be familiar with creating a class by creating a constructor function and then adding methods on, onto the prototype. So this is, that, this is just syntactic sugar. It's an easier way to do that, of creating that same construct. We can add other methods down here. But right here, this is a very simple, very uh, basic class that really just has an empty constructor and nothing else. This is our component. This is the basic building block of Angular 2 as a component. So let's talk about what a component is and how that relates to a directive. So again, we're ignoring the other code. I'm going to go back to my slide. And we're going to talk about directives and components. First, let's talk about directives in Angular 1. There are essentially three types of directives in Angular 1, although nobody really talks about the fact that there are three types. But there really are three types. And as we talk about them, you'll kind of recognize them. The first type we have, we're going to call a component. And this is kind of some terminology that the Angular team came up with way back in the day. A component, um, I like to call them also a widget. This is a, something, a, a directive that has a view. It's almost always implemented as an element, and it's extremely common. That's the most common type of directive that we will build ourselves. Some good examples of this would be widgets like um, a user info panel, where you can just type in user-info tag and tell it which user you want to display, and then it will bring up it will display in that box some information about the user and maybe have some functionality. We can edit, go in and edit the user or edit our profile or something like that. Very common type widget, uh, pre-built pre display and functionality we want to throw up on our website. The second type of directive is we're going to call a decorator. And don't get too hung up on this terminology because none of this is extremely official. So a decorator is usually implemented, is, is almost always implemented without a view and it's usually implemented as an attribute. And it's also rather rare for us to build these ourselves. Some great examples of these are event handlers like ng-click. Um, custom ones that we might build are oftentimes when we need to build our own event handlers. For example, if you're working with the HTML5 video element and you want to have Angular here and respond to the pause event on the HTML5 video, well, you would need to write a custom directive in order to handle that event. So this is a good example of how decorators, what decorators are. They just add, existing, add new functionality to an existing HTML node. And we do write them custom, but they're very, much more rare than how often we write the component type of directives in general. The third type I'm going to call structural. There's a lot of different names that have been thrown around for this. Um, these ones deal with DOM insertion and deletion. And they are almost never built custom by developers. Some good examples of this are ng-repeat and ng-if. These are directives that make significant manipulations to the DOM and um, pull pieces of the DOM in and out. They're mostly written by the Angular team. They're very general purpose. We almost never write them ourselves. 
So let's talk, now that we have an understanding of the three kinds of directives in Angular 1, let's talk about directives in Angular 2. In Angular 2, we also have three types of directives. The first one are officially called components, which we saw in the code that we were looking at. Components have a view. They are implemented as an element. And they are very common. Now, these map really one-to-one -one with the widgets that we are used to in Angular 1. Next, we have directives. Now, this is going to be a little bit confusing because directives is kind of the whole encasing thing. But this is terminology that the Angular team has chosen to use for now. And this has been the terminology they've been using for the last two weeks. It may change within a couple of weeks. Who knows? Um, they've sort of been forced into this because of some other changes that have gone on uh, around ECMAScript and ECMAScript, ECMAScript 6 and 7. So directives are what we were used to as decorators in Angular 1. They don't have a view. They're usually implemented as attributes. And again, they're even rarer in Angular 2 than they are in Angular 1. One of the reasons for this is that, uh, which we will see later on, is that there's no reason anymore to write event handler directives. So we have these two types of directives, the ones that we normally build. The third type, the structural directive that we were used to in Angular 1, exists in Angular 2 as pre-built ones, but we don't have a name for them. They've sort of lost their name for a while. They call them viewports. Um, that's changed. So they don't have an official name. Um, whether or not we can build them ourselves custom or not, we don't know. So they exist, and we will see examples of these built-in ones, but how we build them ourselves has been changing so much that at this point it is not known whether or not um, you can build them yourselves or if you'll ever need to. Let's go back to our code now that we've talked about the relationship between directives in Angular 1 and in Angular 2 and talk about our code. So here we have again our component, which is I'm called to do app. And let's talk about the fact that this is an Angular component. And what we see up here is this crazy syntax that you may not have ever seen before unless you've been watching some Angular um, videos. This is called, it used to be called an annotation. It's now called a decorator, which is one of the reasons why we can't use the term decorator anymore for that other kind of directive. This decorator tells our code that this class right here is a component. It tells Angular that this is a component. This is metadata. If you come from a language or are familiar with languages that have metadata, such as uh, attributes in C Sharp, I know that Java has a similar construct, you will be familiar with the fact that you can annotate code with attributes uh, or metadata. So this is some metadata about this to-do app class that says it's a component. And here is the selector. So this is our first big change. With directives in Angular 1, the name of the directive also determined how it got selected, um, basically how to find it in the HTML. In Angular 2, we can have a name that completely is unrelated to how we select it from the HTML. In this case, the way that this is specified is saying that this is an element that is to do dash apps. If we go back to our index.html, we will see our to-do dash app element. So once Angular has loaded up and run this code, it knows that if it finds a to-do dash app element, that that is this component and to go ahead and run it. Kind of the same matching uh, situation we had in Angular 1 with directives. The other piece of metadata that we've got here is this view uh, decorator. This tells Angular that this component has a view. Here is where to find the view. So we've got a template URL. You can also put in just a template here and write in the HTML inline. And Angular will then know how to go out and grab that view and load it up. And we're going to ignore this part for the moment, line 10, and just talk about uh, how this works. So Angular now knows that it's a component. It's got a view, how to select it, and what the view's HTML is. So if we go and look at this app.html, we will see the view for our, direct, for our component. 
which is a div with two other custom elements in it. Now let's go back to our code and talk a little bit about this uh, syntax here and its alternative. So remember I said that transpilers played an important part. Most of the examples that you're going to find today of Angular 2 are written using this syntax. This syntax, these decorators, are actually part of, are going to be part of the ECMAScript 7 uh, specification, uh, which is also being called JavaScript 2016. So it's not part of ECMAScript 6. It's not implemented in any browser, which is why you will need a transpiler if you want to write your code this way. Now you do not have to write your code this way. You can write it just in plain old ES5. Let's look at an example now that we've seen the ECMAScript 6 way of doing this. Let's look at an example, a side-by-side -side comparison of this um, ECMAScript 6 Plus way and ECMAScript 5. So here we have a little simple comparison of two components. On the left-hand side, we have it written in ECMAScript 5. And on the right-hand side, we have it written in ECMAScript 6. Uh, the line breaks are a little funny just because of the amount of space that we had trying to keep the font size big enough for you guys to see. But basically, um, if we're using ECMAScript 5, we write pretty much the same things, but we have to add an annotations property to our constructor function. And then on that annotations property, which we make an array, we can add in a component annotation and a view annotation. And you notice that if you look at the actual objects, the one that has the selector that says hello-cmp, and the one that has the template, you'll see those exact same objects in the ES5 version versus the ES6 version. So whether or not you want to author in ES5 or ES6 really doesn't matter. Both ways will work. It is a little more convenient to author in ES6. You can see it takes a little bit less code. It's also nice because it sticks the metadata above the class, which is a little bit more common when it comes to where metadata about code goes. It usually goes before the class in most languages or before the construct in most languages. And as we look at um, where we can also use these decorators in injections, and in, in direct dependency injections, we'll see that it also makes it just a little bit easier because it puts it right alongside the code. And we'll see an example of that later on. So there's our comparison of writing Angular 2 and ES5 and ES6. Again, neither case is very difficult but it is very different, very new, and it will take a while to get used to. So going back to our code, let's move on. Let's go back into our app.html, and we can see that we've got this to-do list and this new item. These two things are other components. So what's going on here is back in our config.js, we told Angular, to import app. When it imports app, it gets this component, and then it calls this bootstrap function on it. So let's talk about this bootstrap function. Let's look up here at the Angular at the ES6. This is um, ECMAScript 6 module information. You can see that from our Angular 2 library, we're grabbing a bootstrap function. This bootstrap function is the way that we get Angular to go ahead and start loading and start running. So we always, with Angular 2, start with a single component as our top-level component, and our entire app functions that way. Let's look at a little bit of that conceptually. Or Angular 2 has a component hierarchy. It always starts with one component on top. And it's kind of general um, or usual to call this the app component, but you can really call it anything you want. I call it to-do app in my case. Uh, that top-level component will have all the rest of the app inside of it. If you've done any React, this will be familiar to you. Uh, a component can have a child component, and within that child component we can have more child components. They could be siblings of each other, or they can nest uh, as many layers down as necessary. The way that Angular processes this is it goes along and it finds a custom uh, component. In this case, the custom component is called app. In our demo example, it was to do app in our HTML. But in this case, uh, this example is just app. Angular has loaded up the component for app, and the, using the selector matches that up and notices that this is app. So it goes through, and it expands that out into the view that was given. At that point, Angular continues processing down, 
And now it notices a couple more components. These are not HTML elements. These are custom components that are, have been written. And it will continue on its process of processing those components and expanding them out. So in our sample application, we've got our top-level to-do app. And you've seen in our HTML we have a to-do list and a new item. Let's go back to that HTML and look at that. We've got our to-do list and our new item. Angular 2 is going to see those <clears throat> and not necessarily from the HTML know what to do with them. But in our app.js, we have imported new item right here from our components slash new item uh, file. And we've imported to-do list from our component slash to-do list file. And then we've told our top level component, our to-do app component, that it does have some child directives. We've given it this array of items. Now this is another change between Angular 1 and Angular 2. In Angular 1, all directives were essentially globals. They all existed across the entire global scope of Angular or the global directive registry of Angular, which meant that you could never have two directives with the same name. If you ever imported a third-party directive that had the same name, you had some real problems. You had to kind of figure that out. Uh, modules were really not a namespacing method in Angular 1, contrary to what may, many people might have thought. So we were very limited. In Angular 2, we have the option to specify what directives we're using, and we can um, that, that gives us the opportunity to have two different directives that have the same exact name but are not used, but are used in separate places. And Angular 2 won't throw up um, or explode up when it encounters that because they don't go into some global general registry. We simply tell each piece what directives they need to use. And that way we can only use the directives that are uh, necessary for that piece. This also improves performance. It does mean that you have to, do have to remember to include your directives. One of the most common things that I do is forget to list a directive, and then my Angular 2 code isn't working, and I'm not sure why, and I have to come back and remember, oh, I've got to add that directive. If I say did this and forgot the to-do list, it would stop working. I have to remember to come back in and add it to the list of directives. So let's go in and look at our new item code. The new item code, so our, temp, our example application is your typical to-do list. Uh, a very simple implementation of one. So our new item, we're going to see some of the same things we've seen before. We've got our component uh, metadata or decorator right here. We've got our view decorator. We see the selector and the template URL, which we're familiar with. Um, we're also seeing this injectables. We're going to ignore this for the moment and come back to it. We've got our new item class, which has a constructor. We're going to ignore this for the moment. We're going to see that it's got a couple of methods, a key pressed method and an add item method. The code inside of these is fairly obvious. In the key pressed method, we grab, we receive an event and this thing called input. And we check, this is actually the input box. We check which key was pressed. If it's the enter key, we go ahead and call our add item method. Our add item method simply has a list of items. It pushes a new item onto that list setting its text and completed values, and then sets the input box's text property back to blank. We look at the HTML for our new item. We're going to see some very interesting things. So remember this key pressed method and this add item method. Looking at our HTML, we're going to see a couple of new things in the template syntax about Angular 2 that we've never, we will probably have never seen before in any other um, code, again, again, unless you've been looking at Angular 2. So right here, this is probably going to jump out at you. We have these parentheses around an attribute name. Now a lot of people might initially think that there's something wrong, like this is uh, not standard HTML or valid HTML5. This is actually valid HTML5. This doesn't violate any standards. And this lets Angular know that we want to listen to an event. Now what's really cool about this is this is not a directive. Normally, let's look at this click event here. Normally in Angular 1, if we wanted to list a click event, we'd have to add it in the ng click directive. Right? That means there actually had to exist an ng click directive. With Angular 2, it's much nicer than that. Angular 2, we simply say, inside of parentheses, here is an event that exists on this DOM object that I want to listen to. The button 
has a click event. And you say, I want to listen to the click event, and I want to call this function whenever the click event happens. Well, that means that I can list any event. In fact, if HTML6 comes out and there's uh, new HTML objects with new events, we don't have to have directives for them. If button all of a sudden got a new um, event called triple click, we could simply just add in the event listener if that was added to HTML without having to write any directive. This is actually the name of the DOM event. So this is our first exposure to how Angular 2 is showing us more of the DOM than we would see before in Angular 1. So this is the actual name of the DOM event. Again, here up on our input box, we have a key up. <clears throat> in either case, these are just simply events, and we register event listeners. So then in the, let's look at the key up. We call our key pressed method. We have this dollar event. This is a special sort of reserved word in Angular that says, go ahead and give me the actual event object. This is just the plain JavaScript event object that we would get if we were to register an event listener in just vanilla, plain old JavaScript. Then we've got this second parameter, which is DESC. This is new. This matches this other very strange syntax that we've probably never seen in HTML before, this hashtag DESC. This is in Angular 2 a local variable. It exists only in the HTML. This is a way to create a variable. This variable DESC is a handle to this input DOM object, not the HTML, the actual DOM object in the DOM API. That way we can pass the, a reference to this input box into this key pressed event and into this click event. That way when, our, when we click the buttons add item, we can actually deal with the actual DOM object uh, of the input box or when somebody presses a key and hits the enter key, we can deal with the actual DOM input box. And if we go back and look at the code for a new item, we can see that that's what we're getting and we're getting in this input box. And right here we're able to Grab the, grab the value from the input box, which again, this is the DOM property. This is not some Angular 2 wrapper around the DOM. This is the raw DOM object. We can grab its value, which is the text that's been set in, and we can set it back to a blank string. So we can manipulate the actual DOM object inside of our code. And it makes it very easy for testing. We don't have to worry about some very custom API that Angular has provided. Um, we can, if we want to, not pass in the raw DOM object, we could just pass in the value. If, so if we just needed the value and that was it. But in this case, we're passing in the whole DOM object because we want to manipulate it a little bit. We want to get the value, but we also want to set the value. Let's go up and look at the things that we skipped over. This um, injectables line right here, and then this inject syntax. These two pieces work together. So you can see right here, let's start at line three. I'm importing to-do items from my services slash to-do items. So this is an Angular service. Now you may be wondering that we've seen, so now that we've seen Angular components, how complex services are. We'll look at this in just a second. Um, for right now, all that you need to know is that this is just a plain array. Then here in my injectables, I'm binding this string to-do items to the value of this object right here. This object right here is the value that we got back from our to-do items file. So this is an object. This is a JavaScript object, an array. And we're telling Angular that for this component, I want to bind the string to-do items to this value, which I can use that in injecting that value into the constructor. So now I've gone to the constructor and I've said to the constructor, I want to bring in my to-do items. So go ahead and find the to-do items binded or bound value, and then assign it to the parameter name to-do item list. So it will go up here into the injectables and say, oh, that to-do items is bound to this to-do items object. And so this to-do items object will now be this to-do item list parameter. And then we set that to this.items so that inside of our class we can refer to that. Um, to, uh, as this.items, which we will see uh, down in here, we call this.items.push. Now, we don't have to use this syntax in order to get this service into our class. We can, do we can just bring the service in as a global and then just 
manipulate it by just calling instead of this dot items, we could simply call to do items because it's uh, scoped within this file. But because it's not injected in the constructor, it's not as easy at test time. So this is just a little bit extra way, easier way to inject uh, things into the constructor. And this is the new dependency injection in Angular 2. And something doesn't have to be done, but it is nice to do it, especially when testing. So let's look at the service very briefly. Services in Angular 2 look like this. This is just raw JavaScript. There is no special service in Angular 2 anymore. So that's one of the things that they've done to simplify the mental model is they've essentially gotten rid of those crazy .service, .factory, .value methods. And instead, services are just plain old JavaScript objects. In this case, I'm exporting an array. If I exported a class, then there's ways that I could ask for that class um, in Angular 2 and get a new instance every time rather than having to deal with a singleton. Um, so there's a lot of variability there, but that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today. So let's talk about our other file, which is our to-do list. So back in our app.html, we have the new item, which we've looked at that. We've also got the to-do list. This is going to have a little bit of new stuff as well. So the code here is pretty simple. Um, again, we see our component. We've seen our injectables. We're seeing the same injectables we saw before where we're just bringing in the to-do items so we can work with that. We've got our view and our template. We've got some directives that this list uses, the for and the if. If you're familiar with Angular 1, you can probably guess as to what these do, but we will see what these do in a minute. We've got the same site type of constructor. We're just bringing that to-do items and binding it to the this.items property. We've got a set completed method so that when we complete an item, it calls this code. We've got a complete all method, and then we've got a remove item method. Very simple to do item, uh, to do list functionality. The magic here, or the more interesting stuff, is going to be in the HTML. Here in the HTML, we're going to see something new we haven't seen before. Two new things, in fact. Here, asterisk four. This is the replacement for ng if, or sorry, ng repeat. So. The asterisk 4 has to be brought in by telling the view to the view metadata the directive, list the directive of 4. And we use it in HTML with the asterisk 4 equals var item of items. And then this works just like ng repeat, so we won't give that any more um, consideration. We have asterisk if, which works just like ng if, which means that as long as this condition is true, this thing will exist. If this condition is not true, this DOM node won't even exist in the, in the DOM. But we have our other new thing, which is this um, attribute right here. We have a square bracket checked equals item.completed. This is Angular's binding. So let's go back and just talk really briefly in our slides about binding. Normally, we're used to um, DOM nodes. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide and move on. All right, if we're dealing with input boxes, check boxes, you can, if, you, if you're familiar enough with HTML and you see this, you're going to know that there's a sort of a syntactic, uh, not syntactic error, but an intentional error going on here. If we have a check box and we said it's checked attribute to false, what's going to happen? Well, it's actually going to be true because the checked property is set to true. Or it is the checked attribute if it's present, we'll set the checked property on the DOM object to true. So we can't do this in, um, in HTML. But what we're doing here is not setting the checked attribute. We're actually setting the checked property on the DOM, which is a Boolean property, to whatever item.completed is. We're binding those two things together. That means that the checked property, which is a Boolean value, either true or false, will reflect the value of the item's completed property, which is, again is a Boolean value, either true or false. This is so much nicer because we no longer have to worry about these crazy uh, directives we have to go in and add. We can bind directly to the DOM property. So this, again, is another way where Angular 2 is exposing us to the DOM. So we can bind in this case, we bound the check property to a value. We could bind the value property of an input box, a text input box, to a, a value on our 
uh, model. We can bind just about any property on the DOM. In fact, we can bind any property on the DOM to any property we've got in our model. We've also seen here the typical uh, mustache binding syntax. We're familiar with the Angular one. This just prints out the text. Let's go and check out our um, let's go and check out our running sample, and I'll just show you very briefly how this works. Um, if I hit enter, it's going to add the item. If I add more than one item, then not only does it add the item, but it also gives me my complete. So this is that ng if, that asterisk if, uh, is showing this only when there are two or more items. And if I check it, it completes all of them. And it's binding these two things. Uh, it's binding the checked, the, the checked property of the DOM object for the checkbox to the completed property of my item. And it's not just worrying about trying to set the checked attribute anymore. It's actually setting it in the DOM, which is really convenient and a really cool feature of Angular 2. So that's going to finish up our look at the code. We're going to go back into our slides, and um, we're going to look at migration, <clears throat> which is going to be our last topic. So I'm actually going to end my sharing, and I'm just going to skip ahead to the migration slide. All right. If you are worried about migrating an Angular 1 app to Angular 2, there are a few things you could do right now to make that migration process easier. It isn't a seamless upgrade. You can't just load the Angular 2 um, libraries and your Angular 1 code will work. As you've seen, they're quite a bit different. But there are a few things you can do to mitigate and ease that process. The first one is to use the new router. Uh, the new router is coming out for Angular 1.4. And it's the same, essentially the same code that is used in the router in Angular 2. So if you, use, if you use that new router, that will give you a start because your routing code will be very similar between Angular 1 and Angular 2. The second thing you should do is use the controller as syntax in Angular 2, or sorry, in Angular 1 in your code, because that will make your controllers a lot similar, a lot more similar to how uh, components work. The next thing um, you can do, you can't do this yet, um, but when we do, when Angular 2 does go into its release mode, they have stated right now that you'll be able to run Angular 2 and Angular 1 side by side. So that means that you could basically pick a view at a time from your Angular 1 app and convert that over to Angular 2. And that will make the migration path extremely easy. And that also means that you can take pieces of your app that really are unimportant, not very used very often, or maybe have just have too much technical depth, and delay upgrading those to Angular 2 until it becomes more feasible. For more information on migration, you can watch some of the uh, videos from the NG Vegas conference. They do talk about that in some of the videos about migration. Um, but that's pretty much all we know about migration. So um, that is the end of the presentation. We're going to move on to our questions. All right. Uh, let me just give me a second here to look through the questions. Um, first question, Brendan Boyd. So if it's his, his question is, so if it's so crazy and unstable, then why use it in the first place? Um, so the answer to that, Brendan, is that the Angular 2 is only crazy and unstable at the moment as it's moving through its developer preview process. Obviously, it's going through a stabilization process. By the time it goes into beta and then ultimately to release, it will be very stable um, and not crazy. It's just crazy and unstable right now as the Angular team is making radical changes. Um, they have to deal with the fact that in ECMAScript 7, they've added decorators, yet Angular 2 had a decorator. So they had to switch things and rename things. Um, those are just some of the examples of the changes that they've had to make um, as Angular 2 is going through a mature maturation process and as more people are using it and finding things that can be improved. So um, as of right now, you should definitely not use Angular 2. Angular 2 is not something that you should be using at all in any, anything remotely close to a production type project. But if you want to play around with it, um, on my GitHub repo, you can clone that repo. All the code is included, so that code will work even a year from now. Um, it won't work with the latest version of Angular 2, but I have it included and bundled up the version of Angular 2 that I'm using 
Next question. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, the uh, Pavel, uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher your name if I try to pronounce it Pavel, so I won't try to pronounce it. Uh, Pavel's asked, this approach with ES6 transpiling to ES5, can it be used with Angular 1.3 and 1.4? Absolutely. That transpi transpiler process that lets you author in ES6 but run your code in ES5 can be used with any JavaScript at all. Um, it doesn't matter um, what code you're using, whether you're using Angular or Ember or React or just plain jQuery. You can use ECMAScript 6 today and author in a much nicer syntax, a much more improved syntax than the JavaScript that we're used to, and just transpile it down. So it's becoming more and more popular with a lot of front-end developers. I highly recommend that you do it. I personally think that it's something that um, is very valuable and um, uh, can be used today and should be used today by a lot of teams. All right, next question. Somebody, uh, Krishna is asking, what, we are starting a new multi-year project. Should we use Angular 1 or Angular 2? What do you suggest? So I kind of mentioned this before. As of right now, absolutely use Angular 1. Um, there is a migration path. It's not a very difficult migration path, but Angular 2 is a long time away from releasing, and at this point, you really cannot build much with it. The to-do app is very possible, but more complex apps than that get really difficult because there's just not a lot of documentation available. Very few people understand it. Avoid Angular 2 for right now. It's not ready to be used in production. It will be quite a few months before it is. Um, it's just fine to author in Angular 1 uh, for a couple of reasons. One is you can migrate, but two, Angular 1 is a great framework. There's not gonna, it's never going to break because we never break the web. The web is fully backwards compatible. So an Angular 1 app that runs today will run in 10 years. So if you're going to build your app, finish it in 6 months, and move it into maintenance mode, you may not ever want to migrate it to Angular 2. If you do want to migrate to Angular 2, uh, it will be a relatively straightforward process. <coughs> um, next question. Uh, Mark Volkman asks, why does the to-do app class need to be exported? That's because of the way that the um, ES6 modules work. Uh, this is not something that has to be done when you author your code. You can author your code without doing the export, without doing the uh, ES6 modules. You just basically have to bundle all your code together in one global space so that the classes are together. Um, if you're used to modules or you get some exposure to mod modules, you will see there's a lot of value in them because it, it makes your code a lot more like what we're used to in more server-side co code. So if you're used to Java or uh, C Sharp or one of those uh, more developed languages like that, you're used to the fact that if you want to use um, a piece of code inside of a class, you have to call on some kind of an import statement. So that's just JavaScript's reaction, which lets us build bigger apps. When we take out all of our code and we bundle it all together and stick it all in the same global space, it's easy because we don't have to worry about importing anything, but then we also get all this problem where we've got this one big scope where things can collide with each other. So um, in the long run, it's much better to use some kind of a module system. The ECMAScript 6 module system which we showed today is very valid, uh, but it's certainly not required. You can author in ES5 and not use any kind of a module loader. Next question. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, Giridhar asks, the main intention of HTML is to bring semantic meaning to HTML tags. Do so you think that we are corrupting by writing custom tags like to do? Um, I actually disagree with that. I feel like being able to write custom tags is even more semantic because if you look at the code, you see exactly what that tag is meant to do, and it's kind of a bundling up of a lot of things. It gives you a nice abstraction layer. So I personally like what Angular 1 has always done and Angular 2. Uh, next question, Mark Volkman. Do you really need the var in the keyword in the asterisk for 
uh, properties. We saw that in our code. Um, we saw that little asterisk for, yes, you do need the var keyword. Um, that isn't basically just a little bit of um, JavaScript that's getting uh, eval. This is, it's actually looking for that exact syntax. Um, okay, John McKay, he says, I downloaded Angular 2, and call me an idiot. I won't call you an idiot, John. Uh, but I couldn't actually figure out how to get it to run. Wasn't sure what I needed to do, i.e. what JavaScript classes I needed to add script tags for and in what order in my HTML to get everything running so I could try out a Hello World code. Would you be able to explain this? I can't, I'm not going to go through the process of explaining how Angular 2, um, downloading Angular 2, um, depending on how you downloaded it, uh, trying to get it running. This is part of the fact that Angular 2 is in a very unstable, very developer preview mode. So it means that a lot of what Angular 2 is doing is very difficult to work with. I will show you where I got my code. So I'm going to share out my screen. And I'll show you where I grabbed the code drop that I'm using right now. Well, my browser, right now, Angular is dropping code to code.angularjs.org. And if you scroll way down here at the very bottom, you will see all these 2.0.0 folders. Okay, so for today's demo, I actually used 2.0.0 version 20. Um, you can see that there's no 21. There actually is a 21, but they just didn't drop it to this place. Um, 22 uh, is a lot different than 20 was. So I was using 20 as of a week ago, and in, uh, 22 has changed quite a few things. And so in order to get 22 working, uh, it looks to me like there's a bunch of things that are just not quite right in 22. So I didn't use 22. Uh, again, I apologize for how small this is. Let us see if I can scroll, size this up for everybody. There you go. Uh, 23, if, if this is kind of funny, if you click in there, oh, they have dropped the code. As of yesterday, they hadn't dropped the code in there. So let me just show, I, I, I used version 20, and I was using this file right here, angular2.dev.js. Um, as of yesterday, 23 didn't actually have any files in it. They must have loaded in the files today. So this is where I got the code that I'm using. Um, so you can go ahead and grab this code. And if you kind of follow the same um, format that I've been running, you can get the code to work. But it is really difficult. It's much easier to download somebody else's sample project, like my sample project, and then just manipulate it and start making changes and just start with a working example um, than it is to start off with something fresh and get it to run. I think we are just about out of time. Um, I'll try to answer one last question and then we're going to hit our hour mark. Um, what about editors, IDEs with good support for ECMAScript 6 and 7? Are there any, and what would you recommend? So WebStorm has always done a really good job of support. Now, right now, you're going to have some problems simply because things have been changing a lot in the S7. So WebStorm is not a great thing to play around with Angular 2 at this exact moment. But as uh, ECMAScript 7, uh, the decorator syntax stabilizes, and uh, as Angular 2 stabilizes a little bit, I would highly recommend WebStorm. That's probably my favorite editor. The Visual Studio Code editor that just came out has a lot of promise, um, especially if you're going to use TypeScript. Again, the Angular 2 team has teamed up with the TypeScript team. They're big fans of types. They're, you're going to see a lot of code examples using TypeScript. So um, it, WebStorm has got great support for TypeScript. Of course, uh, the Visual Studio Code editor that just came out is going to have great support for TypeScript. Visual Studio is going to be a fine editor. Um, Sublime, the community around Sublime is really good about getting the plugins up to date and working. So you can see I use Sublime. That was because every other, at the moment, every other editor that I could possibly use just goes crazy on the code that I'm writing and says that everything's wrong and there's errors and everything. I tried doing this in Visual Studio Code and it was a huge, a huge fiasco. So for personally, my favorites are a combination of Sublime and WebStorm. I like WebStorm if I'm doing a little bit bigger project. I like Sublime if I'm doing something quick and simple. Uh, Visual Studio Code, though, is pretty interesting, especially if you, um, it, it's this multi-platform. Um, I'm on a Windows box, so it actually works a little bit better for me than Sublime does. So I'm interested to see how that pans out. So those are my favorite editors and ones that I would recommend for Angular 2. And my personal recommendation is to try to uh, learn TypeScript 
and go with TypeScript for uh, Angular 2 just because it is just a superset of JavaScript. So everything that it works fine in JavaScript is still valid TypeScript, but then you can add in more things as you get as you want them. And being able to get the intelligence around Angular that comes with uh, TypeScript because they have pre-built files that show you that have everything that's built into Angular so that you can um, get all the really good intelligence that you can't get out of pretty much any other editor is um, a really great way to go. So my recommendation is go with TypeScript and something like WebStorm or, or Visual Studio Code. And that's going to be our final question. We, we went one minute over. I apologize to everybody for the extra time. <laughs>